privilege for me to be here this morning to be with you. I am grateful for the opportunity. Uh, I was telling uh, John, who picked me up at the hotel this morning, saying, you know, there's really just a kindred spirit between uh, your church and our church. And, uh, you know, we started in campus ministry. There's a desire for church planting and a desire to do it in different nations of the world, world missions. And so, again, uh, it's kind of like a lost, uh, long lost brother. You know, and then being able to find each other again. And so thank you for the opportunity, Pastor Denny uh, and May, and just inviting me. Uh, you know, it's, it's two years ago I was able to come and visit. And so it's a double honor to be invited. It's, it's honor to be invited and double honor to be invited back, okay? And so I'm grateful. <laughs> thank you. Uh, also for Pastor Steffi and Ellen and just the, all the whole staff has been really, really hospitable. Yesterday we had our staff, uh, you know, team building retreat. It was really, really fun. Um, I want to say this, that you all are blessed to have your leaders and the staff serving with you. And I don't try to say that to be nice because I'm a guest speaker. I mean that because I've been with some of your volunteer leaders Friday night. And then yesterday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. we were together. Uh, It was really, really um, Uh, fun to be with them and just you know you hear people's hearts and when you begin to hear the people's hearts what they what what it actually oozes out of uh, their hearts is what spells the difference in the character of a man and a woman and so I'm just grateful to actually walk with and see uh, men and women again as I say you are blessed and I hope you get the chance to always appreciate and uh, honor your leaders amen all right um I struggled a little bit coming up uh, to the stage because I am hurting today, uh, not because of jet lag, but because we played basketball yesterday, uh, and I, I played uh, with a bunch of 20-year-olds, right? And so I have to remind myself, I'm 48, okay? Uh, every two years, I come here, I get to visit, and so the other time, I was, the two years ago when I visited, I was 46, now I'm 40, I'm going to be 50 by the time I come back again in two years, right? And so by then, I'll probably play chess with Pastor Danny. Okay, we'll just play chess. That's what we'll do. Um, and so, <laughs> so first, uh, first game was decent for me. Second game and third game was a nightmare. You know, the spirit is, uh, spirit is we- willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, you're, you're, you're in your mind, you're making a layup, but your body is back there struggling, right? In your mind, all right? And so if I collapse in the middle of the preaching, you know why. All of us need to stay healthy, all right? And we try, I try. There's an article from uh, Harvard Gazette that I read a few weeks ago talking about good genes are nice, but joy is better. It was an 80-year-old study for, from Harvard embracing and, and saying that we, when we embrace community, it helps us live longer. Study says that, you know, this was actually started, this started in the, during the Great Depression in 1938. And about uh, a few hundred Harvard students participated, including uh, JFK uh, at that time, and then Ben Bradley of the Washington Post. And it expanded to about 1,300 more after that. And so the question they wanted to answer was, what was the major contributing factor to a healthy life? Right? And so the article said this way, and if, if you could, we could flash the next few slides, the surprising finding is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships has a powerful influence on our health, said Robert Waldinger, uh, director of the study, a psychiatrist of Massachusetts General Hospital, and a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Taking care of your body is important, but tending your Uh, Tending to your relationships is a form of self-care too. That, I think, is the revelation. Next slide says, Researchers who have poured through the data, including vast medical records and hundreds of in-person interviews and questionnaires, found a strong correlation between men flourishing lives and relationships with family, friends, and community. Listen to this. Several studies found that people's level of satisfaction with their relationships at age 50 was a better predictor of physical health than their cholesterol levels. Isn't that interesting? So this week, when you go through your care groups and small groups, you can eat all the pork and cholesterol (laughs) as long as you are fun and having fun and, and, and having good relationship together. And it says there, furthermore, when we gather together, everything we knew about them about 
at about age 50, it was in their middle age cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old, said Waldinger. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. They were there, uh, the people who were there most satisfied in their relationships at 50 were the healthiest at age 80. Interesting, right? And so again, a lot of y'all, these, all, all these studies, Indiana, or sorry, Illinois State University had this uh, talk, uh, uh, article about social connections being important to well-being. And on the right side, you'll see just the different stuff, whether that would be pushing uh, the happy meter up, how beneficial it is, increasing your quality of health, pointing to a longer life, cultivates resiliency on, on experience, after experiencing hardship, strengthening your immune system, love, uh, lowering your anxiety and depression, incre increasing self-esteem. So these things. But you see, what these studies show only validates what God has already expressed in Scripture, it is not good for man to be alone. I understand that that's in the context of marriage when he was talking about it, but on the general sense, it is not good for humans to be alone. We were designed to live in community. That we are designed to live in relationship with one another. And, and when you talk about uh, uh, social units and, and communities. That's, that's the church right there. That you and I today, we have something in common. And apart from Jesus Christ saving us by His sheer grace, by His atoning sacrifice in Calvary, apart from that, we would not be together today. I would be in the Philippines, some of you will be in Indonesia, some of you in Michigan, some of you all over the place, or maybe you're in different industries, and because of different social background, because of political leanings, because of educational background, we will all be in different settings today. We wouldn't even be here together, but because of Jesus, everybody say Jesus, because of Jesus, we're here together, amen. You are with a person beside you today. Look at them, smile at them. You are with that person today because of Jesus. And that's what we have and we share in common as a church and as a community. And so I want to talk about the church today and the community that God has placed us in. You know, you have, we don't have this tree, the sequoia tree. We have uh, smaller trees, but you have uh, on different locations all over your, your nation. Uh, you know, they grew up to about, you know, 250 feet. And the reason why they stay strong and they stay tall and upright even through the difficult storms and winds are because of the network of roots that you will find that they are interconnected. You see, you and I today will face a lot of winds and storms in life. But if we're connected with one another, we will stand strong by the grace of God. I want to read from Acts chapter 9, verse 16 to 31. And here we see a narrative of a man who just came to Christ, a man who gave his life to Jesus, encountered him in a supernatural way, and then wanted to connect with community, but he had a few kinks all, uh, 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 along the way before he got into the community. Let me read from chapter 9, verse 26. If I could ask us to stand uh, together as we read in, uh, in honor of God's word. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. The Bible says, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him. He, speaking about Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him. And how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in. And out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 29, and, we, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. 
it multiplied. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is living and it's active and it's a, like a double-edged sword. And so, Lord, today, this morning, as we read, study, meditate, reflect, masticate, and ruminate on your word, I pray, Lord, that even as it went, when, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached the word, and the Bible says, Lord God, that the word cut to their hearts, I pray that your word will cut to our hearts this morning, that you would speak in a way that would minister yes but it will also challenge us as we hear and then leave today in Jesus name we pray amen amen give somebody a high five before you sit down all right all right what did the community in the early church look like and that's what we want to answer today um, and it's, this is fascinating because when you look at scripture it does not hide the mistakes of the early church. That's what I love about the Bible. It doesn't hide the mistakes. It doesn't just show forth a nice, good example. It shows the good and the bad. And so what are the things we can learn from them today? And, and that's how the church is. And I want to start off by saying that, that the church is imperfect. That the church uh, is... Anybody here, you're married, raise your hand. All right. Anybody here, you're not yet married and you're going to get married one day? Woohoo. All right. Come on. All right. Singles. All right. You will. All right. And so, and, and take note, okay, those of you who are not yet married, you're single, okay? Those of you who are married, let me ask you a question. How many of you, you have a perfect marriage? Raise your hand. All right. The reason why it's hard to raise our hands is because we know it's not perfect. You know why? Because the person you're married to is not perfect. And the person you're married to, that, is, that he or she is married to, is not perfect. All right? And so you know what? In that little community right there, you see imperfection. But you know, in, in the big scale, in the church community, it's the same thing. It's because the person beside you is not perfect. And the person on your seat is not perfect. In case you're wondering, that's you, okay? And so... <laughs> And so now, here in verse 26, look at this. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he uh, attempted to join the disciples. They were all afraid of him. He was in Damascus. He met Jesus. This is Saul of Tarsus on the way to Syria. And then he met Jesus. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me, Saul? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he encounters Jesus in a supernatural way. Uh, he gets blinded for, for some days, and then the Lord opens his, the, uh, takes off the scales of his eyes, and he gets connected with Ananias, and he gets discipled. The Bible says he goes off to Arabia. This is, in, this is not in this chapter, but in Je, uh, Je, uh, uh, Galatians, rather. In Galatians, it shows up there, and you'll read that he was there for about three years. And uh, here we see that he just wanted to connect with the disciples. He just wanted to connect with community. And the Bible says they were all afraid of him. This would include Peter, James, and John, the apostles. They, were, they could not believe that this guy who threw people in prison, who gave the thumbs up sign for Stephen to be stoned to death, was the very guy who's wanting to join their group, their community. And they're probably wondering, is this guy a spy, a mole or something? Is he trying to go uh, in and infiltrate so that he can also throw us into prison? We're not sure. Right? They did not believe he was a disciple, the Bible says. This guy killed our buddy Stephen. Right? Um, do you know anybody here who's so far away from God you wouldn't think they'd come to Christ? Right? Um, maybe that was you too. That was you years ago. Um, yesterday we had dinner and uh, Pastor Danny was sharing with us a few of his stories. I will not tell you all his stories. Um, uh, uh, I couldn't even believe uh, the things that, you know, this is pre-Jesus, okay? Uh, but it was fun. It was fun to hear. But, you know, he was saying that when he went back to Bandung in his city and he started to preach in a crusader in a big gathering, people could not believe him. 
uh, could not believe that this was the guy who they saw in elementary uh, or even in high school that was uh, doing all the pranks and stuff, all right? Um, I won't tell you all, but there was one, I, the, 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 the tamer one, okay? He, he had a chemistry exam, okay? He had a chemistry exam, and so that morning, uh, in st- so, because he wasn't able to, you know, study and he, you know, he didn't want to fail the class. So what he did at 4 a.m., he went to the teacher's house, right, and put a pod, uh, padlock on the gate, all right, and locked it and threw the key. And so the, the teacher could not get out of his house, all right. And so um, I hope I was okay, Pastor. We're on live stream. Okay, cut that live stream now, okay. <laughs> Uh, but this is just all the stuff that he did. And so the teachers couldn't believe this. Is, is this the Danny we know? All right, he's preaching the gospel, right? And so um, it, it's just, how many of you are thankful for the grace of God? <laughs> uh, amen. You wouldn't have your pastor today, okay, if not for the grace of God. But you know what? That's all of us. He just told the story. If we told our story on stage... Some of our stories would be worse. My would. Verse 27. But Barnabas took him. This is a term of contrast. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord. Um. In another version, it says there, but Barnabas accepted Saul. Barnabas. Barney. (laughs) Such a cuddly character, isn't he? Um, He took Saul in and explained three things. He'd seen Jesus, spoke to Jesus, and preached in the name of Jesus. I want to talk to you about a few of the trademarks of the church community today. The first one is acceptance. Acceptance. You and I today have been accepted in the beloved, not because of our merit, but if, because of Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, to all who believed in his name, we all have been accepted if we believe in Jesus by his sacrifice on the cross. We've become children of God. All of us were far away before knowing this truth, before the gospel was preached. And how thankful am I? To come to his presence today because of that truth. If Jesus is so welcoming, shouldn't the church be the same? He says, God so loved the world he gave that whosoever, that whosoever statement right there is a word. It's it's all encompassing. It's anyone else, everyone else, whoever wants to. Question, can we embrace people no matter what their past has been? These guys knew the past of Paul or Saul. Some of them had a hard time believing, has he really changed? And sometimes we have a hard time, has this person really changed? And we have a hard time accepting people. But you see, because Jesus accepted us when we were at our worst, we're called to do the same to the others we encounter. You know, I remember there was a, there was a guy in our church who first attended, and, you know, he, one of the, I received a, a, a text message after church, and somebody said, Pastor Paolo, you need to talk to this guy. That guy was a famous guy because he was a celebrity. He says, you need to talk to this guy because I saw him in the front steps of the church that he was smoking, okay, he was smoking cigarette. And, uh, you know, you better tell him off, Right. And I said, you know what? I answered him, you know what? Thank you for your feedback. But it was his first time in church. I'm just so glad he's in church today. Just so glad he's in church today. You know why? Because sometimes what happens is this. We're so excited or overzealous of telling people, this is wrong. You need to change this. You need to transform your life. This is such, this is going to get you to hell. You know, this thing or that thing you need to get rid of in your life. 
listen, we need to invite them and introduce them to Jesus first. And everything else God will take care of after that. They don't even know Jesus yet. And we're worried about this and that. We need to introduce them to Christ. And Christ will be the one to transform them. We don't have to be the vice Holy Spirit. We don't have to be the assistant of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will do it. I, I talked to a guy one time. He says, you know, I don't, I, I don't feel worthy to go to church because I'm so unclean. I asked him a question. Do you have a washing machine? He says, yes. All right, what's your question then? I said, yeah, well, do you, you know, when you put your clothes in the washing machine, do you clean them first before putting them in? He says, that's ridiculous. Of course. So you come to Jesus, not because you're clean. You come to Jesus because you need him because he is the only one who can genuinely and authentically cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. I love what uh, Francis Schaeffer said. Our relationship with each other is the cr criterion the world uses to judge where our, whether, sorry, that's a typo, whether our message is truthful. Christian community is the final apologetic. Christian community is the final apologetic. And, and you see, I know we desire to pursue holiness. And it's good to pursue holiness. In fact, I'm not saying to lower down that standard. Our God is holy. And that has to be, be. Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. But the holiness you and I attain today is not because of our good work. It's because Jesus stamped and gave us the robes of righteousness. And we are holy today by the blood of Jesus. You know, the, they say that the cleanest, one of the cleanest areas in the planet today is the South Pole. No bacteria can survive. <laughs> uh, it's the cleanest, and I hear it's also the cheapest real estate. <laughs> but no one wants to be there because it's cold. Listen, we don't want the church to be the clean, cleanest and yet it's cold. Again, I'm not talking about lowering standards. Jesus is holy. We need to pursue that. Number two, affirmation. There was acceptance in the community. And there's affirmation in the community. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them, Right? Declare to them. To declare means to set forth, to recount, to relate in full. In the message version, it says, Then Barnabas took him under his wing. Aren't you grateful for people who take you under their wing? Or who took you under their wing? That they walked with you. You were so far away from the Lord. And yet it says, come on, hold my hand. We're going to walk together. This difficult time of your life, I'm going to go with you. This time of, of being far away from Jesus, I'm going to walk with you. I'm grateful for people in my life who did that for me. I'm thankful for Pastor Joey and Marie. Two years ago, my wife and I were going through a rough patch in our marriage. And we do go through stuff also, as, even as pastors. That's why you need to pray for your pastors. And so we were going through a difficult season, and I had to call Pastor Joey. Pastor Joey, when are you back from Singapore? I need to sit down with you. And sat down with us. It was really, a lot of it was my selfishness. God had to fix in my heart. And I'm just so thankful that somebody spoke into my life. That's why you need a care group. You need people walking with you. Because they need to tell you what you don't want to hear. Sometimes we, we just like people talking to us about what we want to hear. That's not really helpful. It's not really healthy. Doesn't won't really make you grow though. It'll make you feel good, but it might not make you grow. And so I had to hear it from Pastor Joey, and I'm just so thankful. You see, Paul was accepted and was affirmed in spite of their, his past. Sometimes we get we have a hard time getting past our past. Or their past. Or other people's past. But God doesn't define your identity based on your past, but on Christ's sacrifice. That you today are accepted because of what he's done. You know, um, this was a years, years ago when, 
when a, um, a lady in church went viral, or not lady in church, a lady who went viral because she was in the train station and started shouting at the security there. And um, she, was, she was upset because the security was, did something wrong and, and she confronted the security and she started saying a statement, something like, uh, are you telling me I'm a liar? Are you telling me, telling me I'm a liar? And so what happened was, um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, I talked about um, she was cyber bullied because it was take, a video was taken of her shouting at the security and it went viral all over the Philippines. And a hashtag was actually made from that, I'm a liar. Okay, Are you telling me I'm a liar? Right, And then that became the hashtag and it just went viral. And of course, she was cyber bullied. And you know, how many of you know it? It just it, it gets harsh on the internet sometimes. It really, you know, it gets really rude and harsh. And so she understood that she was wrong, but she didn't really deserve all that, though. And so it got viral, and people were hating on her online until somebody sent her a direct message on Twitter and said, "I want to tell you that you are loved by God." And I am with you. I'm praying with you. If any, if and any time you want to have, you want somebody praying with you. Message me. So they met, and she was crying, and she gave her life to Christ. You know what? Today she went through Bible school, and she's preaching the gospel from place to place, campus to campus, church to church. Today, she was in church one time. God transforms. But we need to get past their past as God saw, saw us in our worst and yet get past that, got past that. Final one, I'll end with this one. There was an anointing to preach. And the church, as we're affirmed, as we're accepted, listen, it, it's nice to be in church, but we're not called to just be in church. I've heard people, you know, I wish we can just get together and, you know, worship the Lord every day, 24-7. I'm not sure if that's really a good idea, though. Uh, we'll get cabin fever after a while. But we're together, right? And we're, 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 it's good to be that, but we need to go out. There's a world out there who hasn't heard about Christ. Right? The goal is not just to stick together. The goal is to go out and meet uh, bring people to Christ. And, and here's verse 28. The Bible says, So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of Jesus. I love that. He went in and he went out. He went in the community. Oops. And he went out after that. And then in and out, in and out, in and out. And that's what we're called to do. Every Sunday we come together or maybe even during the week, during small groups, we go in and then we go out to our offices. We go in the community and then go out to our campuses. We go in the community and go out to our neighborhoods. And then because of that, as a result of the strengthening, we're able to preach the gospel and share the love of Jesus because we've been strengthened and recharged. You all have your phones, right? And your phones need to be charged every so often so that you can communicate listen God wants to charge you up in the community so that you can communicate the best story ever told yeah. verse 31 I'll end with this one so the church throughout all Judea Galilee Samaria had peace and were being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit the church multiplied the church multiplied the church multiplied you know, I'm just so encouraged. The last time I was here, I've, I, I see more people involved. I see, I see more people here. It's, your, your church is growing, and your pastors are doing an amazing job. And every single one of you, listen, the church is not just this. The church is when you're out there. The church is not the building. The church is the people. And so when you go out there, you are the church, right? God forbid, you know, there's an earthquake and all that. If this collapses, listen, church will not stop. We have a church in China, and two churches have been closed down. But the church has continued to go and multiply ever since that church facility was closed down. It's multiplied to about four now. That two churches, now has four churches in homes. The church is unstoppable. 
Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Will not prevail. But listen, this church right here, this community right here has to be grounded on Christ. He is alone, the foundation. And, and this community we're called into, um, Dallas Willard in his book, The Kingdom Life, talked about this. He said, we're called in a community of grace. The reason why we can dispense of grace is because we've received grace. That's the only reason, right? And so um, grace, Joseph Cook said it this way, grace is nothing more or less than the face that love wears when it meets imperfection, weakness, failure, sin. Grace is what love is and does when it meets the sinful and the undeserving. Sinful and undeserving, raise your hand, right? Sinful and undeserving. It's what enables us to see beyond one another's faults so that we can love one another without reference to whether that love has been earned or deserved. We've never earned or deserved the love of God. Because of that, we can do the same. It's what God does when He reaches out in love, sinful as we are, and we welcomes us into a relationship with Himself. You see, I can tell you a really nice sermon today, and you'll say, wow, that was really good. But unless that is activated and brought into application in the community, it's just a nice sermon. I can talk about kindness, but if you don't see kindness in me, listen, sermon truth will always lose out to environmental truth when the two are in conflict. What's that mean? I can talk about a good sermon. I can speak a nice message. But if the environment, if the stuff that you see, okay, is contradictory, sermon truth will always lose out to environmental truth when the two are in conflict. Let me wrap it up. I, I listened to the stories of Pastor Denny, of um, Pastor Steffi, John, everyone else, and how you've walked in this setting through the years. You know, we, today we live in a world of disposable relationships. The, the word unfriend is actually now a word, right? It's, you actually unfriend people today. Okay, but that's not what God's called us to be in. And we were called in covenant relationships. And watching Pastor Dan, and even, even just watching their posts from Pastor Jimmy and him and just Pastor Sammy, all the guys that are, are leading this movement, they've walked together not just for months, not even just for years. They walked for decades. They were students when the Lord saved them. But they've walked together through decades. And what a picture of community and covenant relationships. Have they offended one another? Have you offended one another? <laughs> He's laughing because it's, yeah. And listen, that's, that's the church community. And listen, if, if you've been offended by the church community here or outside or wherever else on behalf of the church of Jesus, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm so sad that you've been offended by somebody in church or by a pastor. But don't give up on church community. If somebody has said something, you've been accused, you've been scammed, you've been told lies. They've promised you, you they didn't fulfill their promise. Or you had a relationship with somebody in church and they just outright, flat out, hurt you? I'm sorry. But don't give up on relationships. You've been designed, hardwired to be in community. These days, it's easy to, I mean, we're on live stream now. It's easy to just click technology and we think, we're growing in our faith. But real, authentic growth happens when you're face-to-face -face 
when somebody speaks into your life, when somebody walks with you, when somebody holds your hand, when somebody taps your shoulder and says, you're not treating your wife right. It's not a good thing. Surely we'll be offended and we will offend other people. But walking in community is still worth it. Don't give up on community, guys. He went in and out, and he was anointed to preach the gospel. This is the final apologetic. When we have this community, tap the person beside you and say, I'm glad I'm walking with you in this journey. Come on, tap the person beside you. Thank you, Jesus, for this person. Let me end with this verse. You know the term of contrast we said earlier about Barnabas? There's another term of contrast that shows up in Ephesians. One greater than Barnabas, but God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love which, with which He loved us even when we were dead. In our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. But God, I'm just so grateful God did that. I was telling Pastor Denny my story. I'm just grateful the Lord saved me. My parents separated before I, won I turned one year old. I didn't see my dad for 15 years. First time I met him, I was 16. I didn't see him. I would see him once a year. I became a Christian at 17. I'm so thankful that he gave me security, identity, significance in him. 23 years old, I was in a small group meeting. Steve Merle was our, my, uh, my small group leader and he's talking about honoring. Parents, honor your father and your mother, period. It didn't, it didn't have a clause there that said, if they're nice, if they're good, if they're honorable, honor them. It says, honor your father and mother, period. That night, I called Pastor Steve. I said, Pastor Steve, could you pray for me? I wasn't even in ministry at that time. Can you pray for me? Because I, I'm going to set up an appointment with my dad. The next day, I, said, I had lunch with him. I picked him up in the office. I said, Papa. And he's a broadcaster, so he could talk for hours and hours. And so I, I said, Papa, could you? Give me a few minutes, and I said, I wanted to meet with you because I wanted to tell you that I honor you as my dad. I was in a Bible study. I was reminded of this verse, and I know it didn't work out with you and mom. I'm just grateful that I get this opportunity to tell you I honor you. And given the last, given, given an opportunity to choose the last name again, I'll choose Punzalan all over again. I love you, and I want to rebuild whatever was broken in the past. You know, I felt at that time God broke the wall before us and the Lord restored our relationship. In fact, my son, who's 23 now, eight years old at that time, was so surprised, so surprised that I didn't grow up with my dad because God so restored the relationship. We were so close. He walked me down the aisle when I got married, 24 years old. The Lord fixed it. When I brought him back to his office, he gave me a hug and he said, I love you, son. I've always heard that statement from a woman called my mother, but for, 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 for me to hear from a man, my father, that completed me as a man. And then years later, I read the book, The Blessing, Gary Smalley. And I said, Papa, could you bless me? What's that? Uh, just pray for me and bless me. What do you, what's, what's that? Okay, how do I do that, right? Here, give me your hand. Put your hand over my head. And say this prayer, dear Jesus. And I told him the prayer, all right? And then just add a little bit after that. And so he prayed for me. For a few years prior, he say, said, I love you, son. That completed me as a man. When he blessed me, that completed me as a son. Today, I mean, he's a few years after that, he had a heart attack. I went to the ICU the night before. It was closed. 
I stayed for a few hours because I wanted to wait the next day. So I stayed in the car. I slept in the car, woke up uh, 7 a.m., went into the ICU, shared the gospel to him. I said, Papa, I do this all the time, whether in a basketball court, on, a, on, on in the office, or, or in a hospital bed. Could you pray with me? This is what Jesus did for you. And he accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. After he said amen, I read Psalm 34. It's not a long chapter. Halfway through, I kid you not, he had his one last final heart attack and he was gone in a few minutes. That's the grace of God in my life. Because prior to that, I heard the word honor and I made that commitment to say, okay, I'm going to humble myself, Lord. Help me. God paved the way to, for me to talk to my dad. God fixed the relationship, and that paved the way for me to explain the gospel to my dad. She in heaven today. But God, who's rich in mercy, because of his great love, he loved us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, there's, there's so much to say about your grace and your goodness and your love. Lord, we won't be here today apart from your mercy. Justice says we deserved. We, we, we will get what we deserved. But mercy says you withheld what we deserved. But grace says we get what we don't deserve. And so, Lord, I pray we will continue to bask and enjoy and cherish that truth in the name of Jesus. Amen.